Welcome back to this edition of Virtual Giliati, where today we are talking about the largest, the greatest amphibious invasion in world history, D-Day, the Normandy landings during World War II. So, of course, this is part of our World War II in 1944 series, and D-Day is obviously one of the most significant, most important events of World War II in general, where the Allies establish a beachhead and begin to push back into France and eventually drive the Germans out of France and back into Germany. So uh, after the fall of France in 1940, like we've talked about, Britain was standing alone, but by the end of 1941, the United States and the Soviet Union had gotten involved in the fight, and there was always this desire, this discussion of how can France be retaken, how can the Allies invade? Um, it seems like it would be very easy because the English Channel is not all of that wide, uh, but it was an extremely difficult proposition to take troops from Great Britain and land them on a beach in northern France, uh, they're an area known as Normandy, uh, and then establish a beachhead, resupply that beachhead, and continue to fight a well-entrenched German army. So D-Day took years and years of planning. Uh, it was one of the most dangerous operations ever conducted. It was one of the biggest gambles that a military commander like Dwight D. Eisenhower uh, had ever uh, tried. So uh, D-Day is a fascinating thing to learn about, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about it here in this video. So first off, uh, General Eisenhower at the end of 1943 was made what they call the Supreme Commander of Allied Forces. Uh, basically what that means is he was put in charge of all American, all British, um, whatever free French forces, free Polish forces, other free countries' forces, uh, other than the Soviet forces, uh, he was in charge of. And so he begins this process of planning Operation Overlord. Uh, he had worked on Operation Torch uh, down in North Africa, and eventually uh, by the end of 1943, while the Italian campaign was still going on, uh, he starts to really look into how can we invade France, northern France, from southern England. Uh, and of course, uh, the operation has to be codenamed so that the Germans don't know what they're planning. And you'll see there's a lot of deceit in all of this. Uh, and the name he comes up with is Operation Overlord. Uh, the plan was kept top secret, even as thousands of troops, tanks, landing craft, aircraft, you name it, were pouring into England uh, for the invasion. Uh, even as the people in England were busy getting ready to help support the troops with doing things like making parachutes and, and everything else, uh, the, the, the mission itself, the, the operation itself, uh, Operation Overlord, was kept top secret. They even went as far as creating a phony army. We saw that in one of those fun facts about 1944. Uh, the Germans were convinced that the Allies were going to land at the Pal de Calais, uh, which is the point where France and Britain are the closest. Um, they're actually only a few miles apart, uh, and so the Germans were convinced that that is where the Allies would land. And so uh, Eisenhower ran with that. Um, he created a phony army. Now, when I say a phony army, um, he put a bunch of reserve troops right across from the Pau de Calais in Kent, England, um, they were troops that weren't necessarily going to be used for the invasion anyway, but they looked like an army. Uh, they had inflatable tanks, inflatable airplanes. They had phony radio traffic going back and forth as if they were a real army. Um, and he put uh, the man who the Germans believed was the best American fighting general in charge of the phony army, George S. Patton. And you might remember Patton. He fought across North Africa, fought against Rommel. Uh, he is part of the invasion of Sicily along with General Montgomery. Well, while he is on Sicily, the fighting is fierce, it's heavy. Uh, he comes across a, a soldier in a hospital who was suffering from shell shock. Uh, and at that moment, Patton had called him a coward and slapped him. Uh, and his command was removed. Eisenhower removed him from command. Um, and so uh, Eisenhower basically banned Patton, at least at first, from taking part in the invasion. But he was the perfect decoy. So he was in southern England with this phony army, and the Germans assumed it was his army that was going to spearhead the invasion. And so when the real invasion comes, the Germans hold back, hold back, hold back, just waiting for Patton, who obviously is in command of nothing more than 
these inflatable tanks, which is a pretty pretty big part of this, pretty big uh, deception. Um, what Eisenhower plans basically is this huge invasion. It's going to use everything you can imagine. It's going to use air power, air power to bomb German defenses, air power to drop paratroopers in. It's going to use naval power, naval guns to pound German defenses along the coast, uh, naval uh, obviously ships to bring the troops to the landing zones. They even created um, a, what's called the Higgins Landing Craft, which was a boat designed uh, just to invade, um, you know, just to invade uh, the Normandy beachhead. Um, he also goes ahead and maps out the area that they're going to invade, uh, and Eisenhower comes up with five specific beaches. Two of them the Americans are going to invade, two of them the British are going to invade, and one of them the Canadians are going to invade. And he codenames them, things that have nothing to do with those areas in France. Things like Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, Sword. Uh, has nothing to do with anything in northern France. Uh, another way that they can throw the Germans off. That being said, on the other side of the English Channel, the Germans have had years to plan their defense. And they have created what is known as the Atlantic Wall. The Atlantic Wall is this whole string of defenses that literally stretched from Spain all the way back up the coast. Uh, and they were just waiting at some point for the Allies to invade. These defenses um, were layered. So you would have lots and lots of German troops. Um, you would have uh, machine gun nests. You would have huge artillery pieces. You'd have concrete bunkers, tank traps, landmines, barbed wires, you name it, they had it. Uh, and there was some discussion of, you know, how to, within the German army, how best to defend against the invasion. Uh, you know, do you spread your troops out along the coast or do you hold them back, wait for the Allies to land and attack them uh, with panzers and things like that? Uh, Erwin Rommel was uh, the German general, more or less in charge of the Atlantic Wall, uh, and his thought was that if he ever let the Allies off the beach, he would lose the war. And so he put all of his efforts into building this Atlantic Wall and, and fortifying uh, the coastline, uh, which was a really tall order because, of course, the coastline is so long, you have no idea where the Allies are going to land, and you kind of spread all of your uh, resources out. Uh, there were some German panzers held back, but as you'll see once the invasion starts, they're not used effectively. So uh, the Allies, when they uh, are planning Operation Overlord, they are taking pictures of all these things. They know where all of these fortifications are, uh, aerial reconnaissance. So uh, they'd fly over and take pictures, uh, and they would try to figure out how best to neutralize them. And you'll see they don't really do all that great of a job given the, the circumstances. All right, so June 1944, uh, really if you go back to May, um, Eisenhower is just looking for the best day to invade. And the English Channel has some of the worst weather in the world, some of the worst tides in the world. you got to worry about the moon, I mean, all these different things. Um, and so finally, uh, Eisenhower gets an opportunity. Um, the weather was sort of bad. The tides were sort of bad, uh, which made the Germans think, well, there's no way the Allies are going to invade today. And Rommel actually goes home to visit his family uh, when the uh, when the attack begins, uh, the evening of June fifth, nineteen forty four, Eisenhower meets with all of his uh, top commanders. He thinks about it for a while, and then he says, "Okay, we'll go. Let's go." And so that evening, they launch the attack. The attack began with airborne troops. So we're talking about troops uh, dropped in from parachutes in the middle of the night. Uh, they also used these gliders. These gliders were basically airplanes with no engines. Uh, they would be towed up into the air uh, by an airplane, and then they let go, and they're able to sort of glide down to a position. Truthfully, they didn't work all that well. Um, and, of course, these paratroopers as well are also subject to wind and darkness and all of these things. So the invasion begins with these airborne troops, and the whole idea of the airborne troops is they're going to drop in strategic locations, uh, bridges, communication points. Uh, airfields, things that the, the Allies want to gain control of. They're also going to cause a lot of turmoil behind the defensive lines where the Germans won't know exactly where these troops are. Problem with the airborne version of the attack is that honestly they get all messed up. Uh, the wind blows them around, some of them get killed, uh, some of them, uh, there's a famous story of one ending up on the top of the uh, steeple of a church, uh, a place called St. Mary Glaze, 
Uh, and so it's sort of chaotic. Uh, there is heavy, heavy fighting with these airborne troops and the Germans in that area. Uh, Northern France is known as Normandy. It's a very old area, you know, dates back to a thousand years or so. So there's all these old quaint little towns uh, where all of this fighting was taking place, like I said, like St. Mary Glaze and some of these others. So the paratroopers go in. Uh, then in the morning, you start to see the rest of it unfold. So about 3 a.m., the beachheads are bombed. Uh, aircraft, lots of bombs, destroying as many of the German defenses as they possibly can. Uh, shortly after that, the Navy opens up huge uh, cannon fire from all the ships. Uh, and the hope was that they could destroy all those German defenses before the Allied troops ever hit the beach. Well, about 6.30 a.m., the first Allied troops hit the beach, and it's very clear right away that those German defenses had not been destroyed. Uh, these Allied troops are pinned down. They are under heavy machine gun fire uh, from the Germans, heavy artillery fire from the Germans. Uh, many of them never make it out of the landing craft. Some of them drown because their equipment is so heavy. Uh, they had hoped to bring in these amphibious tanks uh, that would allow them to kind of roll up uh, the beach to the defenses, and those sunk to the bottom of the channel. Uh, units were split up. Uh, they had to sort of regroup on the beach under heavy fire, uh, take cover wherever they could. Uh, and in the first phase of this landing, over 50% of the men were killed. Uh, it's a pretty, uh, pretty dire situation. It looks like it may actually fail. But the bravery of the men on the beach really is what turns the tide. These men are able to improvise, pick up supplies, rally themselves together. They eventually make their way across the beach under heavy fire, uh, break through some of the German defenses, start to clear out the German bunkers. And within about 12 hours, they have captured a foothold in France. Uh, it took them that long. Uh, it took over 4,500 Allied troops uh, being killed and about 9,000 being wounded just to get that foothold, just to get that uh, beachhead. If you think about that, that's an astonishing number. Um, Hitler, when the invasion began, was asleep. Uh, nobody wanted to wake him up to tell him. Rommel was home visiting his family, uh, and so the German response to this was very, very slow. Once Hitler found out, he assumed that this landing at Normandy was just sort of like a diversion and that the real army was coming with Patton uh, out Calais. And so again, hours and hours pass before he redeploys his panzers, uh, before he uh, realizes that this landing here at Normandy was the main attack. What's going to happen from that point on, of course, is that the Allies are going to use those beachheads that cost so much. Uh, to bring in more and more and more troops. Uh, most of the ports were unusable along the uh, coastline, so the British actually built their own ports. They called them mulberries. Mulberries was just their code name. They were these big cement blocks that once they had the beachhead, they would float over the English Channel, and then they would sink them to make their own harbor, allowing the Allies to pour in even more and more supplies. And so in the next video, we're going to look at all right, now that the Allies have the beachhead, what happens next? So D-Day, obviously, the greatest amphibious invasion in the history of the world. Definitely something you should know about. I know the assignment has a nice reading about it and everything else, so please uh, let me know if you have any questions, and we'll see you next time here at Virtual Julia.